What is up, guys? So I thought it'd be a fun way to end the year with reviewing Jim Henson's Greek myths. So this series was actually out in December of 91. So it's kind of fitting to end this year's videos with this. So we're going to review and watch Jim Henson's Greek myths, which the storyteller, um, Greek myths, and um, I'm going to do it as I watch it. I've never seen these before, so I'm going to watch it and review it for all four stories. So that, let's go to it. So it's going to be the story of Orpheus. It's the story of Daedalus and Icarus. Uh, Perseus and Perseus. And then the story of the Minotaur. So those are the four stories. Let's see how good they are. I'm expecting great things being Jim Henson. I can only imagine it's going to be Creature Shops in you know his like kind of like labyrinth kind of stuff going on so let's check it out So the first story is of Daedalus and Icarus, and everyone knows this story more than any other myth that's probably featured on this series. And before I go into my review of Daedalus and Icarus, I want to just mention that Michael Gambon, who is the storyteller in these four episodes, does an incredible job. Michael Gambon, you may not know the name, but he's probably most famous now for taking over as Dumbledore later in the Harry Potter series. So he does an excellent job as the storyteller. And then the storyteller is accompanied by his pet dog, played by Brian Henson, who is the son of Jim Henson. All right, so this is to the story of Daedalus and Icarus. So we all know the story about how Icarus flew hot, too high and hit the sun, or flew too close to the sun and melted his wings. The story doesn't start there. We get the full story of Daedalus for the most part. So we see how Daedalus had his son Icarus, who was clumsy and not as inventive as his father. But Daedalus had a nephew who was going to be just as good, if not better, as Daedalus when he grew up to be an adult. And that kind of made Daedalus jealous that his son Icarus could not be as talented as his cousin. And so, as in myth, Daedalus ends up killing his nephew. So some people don't know that part of the story, but yeah, Daedalus kills his nephew. On this show, it's by accident, or so they say, but they still kind of imply that it was on purpose, even though he denies it and says that he did it by accident. And um, eventually he is sent to King Minos, just as in the myth, to make the labyrinth. And so they go to the labyrinth, he and his son, after it's invented, they're in prison there by King Minos. And that's when they escape using the wings of birds, or the feathers of the birds, to make wings for themselves. And they escape, and then the famous part happens of Icarus flying too high and dying. Which is really shocking. So what can I say about this episode is that they did not stay away from the death and revenge. Um, being Jim Henson, I mean, it's like kind of hearing Disney. You kind of expect it to cut back and hold back a little bit and they don't do that in this episode they literally show Icarus falling and dying and they show his dead body floating in the water which was a little shocking and it took me back a little and it was actually really touching as well I don't know if it's because I have a child or it's because I've never really seen it portrayed on TV before but when Daedalus is holding the body of his son and crying over the, his body it was very sad and it was really well done and so Daedalus decides that he's going to get revenge on King Minos, who imprisoned he and his son in the labyrinth. And so just as in the, real, as in the story and the myth, um, he, time goes by, and then he finally gets his chance to take revenge. And they don't show him, they show him killing the king, but they don't get like R-rated about it, of how it's done. They just describe what happens. 
And so, very well done. So, I it made me excited to see the other three episodes and hear the three stories. It really helps with Michael Gambon, who is the narrator, the storyteller, because it feels like ancient times, like you're listening to the elder of the town or whatever just telling you this story. And then you see it, and it goes back to the storyteller, and then you see the next scene as he narrates what's happening. Really well done. So the second is the story of Eurydice and Orpheus. The Orphic hymns that I constantly read from are said to have been written by Orpheus, the son of one of the muses whose music would actually make the rain fall and crops grow. He was the most talented of all the musicians in myth. He was part with Jason and the Argonauts. And we all know the story of Orpheus and Eurydice, how he fell in love with a woman named Eurydice who happened to die because she was bitten by a snake. And so he was in love with her so much that he went down to Hades to bring her back and he pleaded with Hades the god and Persephone to let her live again and Hades made the promise that if she would go back with him if he was able to leave Hades with her behind him and she would follow but the catch was that if he ever turned around to make sure she was following him because shades or the dead people do not make sound. So he wasn't sure that she was actually following him, but if he turned to check, she would be in Hades forever and he would never have her again. So that's the story of Orpheus and Eurydice. I don't really want to spoil the ending of that story because you can check it out and you may already know the ending, but it's a tragic story. Very sad. I mentioned how I almost cried for Daedalus and Icarus. This was even more depressing of a story. Beautiful story. Very well done. The music, the story, the acting, very well done. I was also really impressed with the gods and actually how they were handled in the story. In the story, you get to see Charon, the ferryman. You get to see Hades and Persephone. This is the closest version of Hades to classic Greek myth that I've ever seen or heard on film. I, way better than anything, especially, I mean, like, obviously the Disney version, like Disney's Hercules with the blue skin and green and fire, but even on uh, Clash of the Titans, the modern Clash of the Titans, how he's always the villain and the bad guy. On this story, he's not really the bad guy. He's just the god of the underworld. He's cold and distant, which in myth, Hades was called to be cold and distant, who didn't like worship, who didn't like anything like that. So it fit the classic view of Hades very well. Being cold, distant, and that the Orpheus could move the stars literally and music and make, and the music can make things grow and the clouds rain, but it wouldn't, couldn't move Hades. It was the pleading of Persephone that Hades agreed to help Orpheus. So, and I like how he also included how the people are even afraid to mention the name of Hades in fear that Hades would hear it and join them and bring death and destruction, which is the way they saw it. You couldn't say the name or for fear of what would happen if that name was ever said. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. It's a beautiful story. Again, very tragic. But Greek mythology is tragic. And to see it on screen and to see it enacted, it was it was touching. So much so I was welling up with tears and not in a sweet way, but it was just such a depressing thing that it was very sad. Even talking about it makes me sad. Very well done. Very well done. Awesome. And so the third story is Theseus and the Minotaur. So Theseus grows up to discover that he's the son of a king and joins the, his father in the king's palace. Now, the story of the Minotaur is that every seven years, the kingdom would send seven people to be offered as a sacrifice to the Minotaur. So Theseus is tired of every seven years 
having people sent to be slaughtered. And so he puts on the robes of those that are going to be sacrificed and travels to Crete to face the Minotaur, to kill the Minotaur, so that this routine cycle of sacrificing people will be done and over with. And he meets Ariadne, who he eventually falls in love with, or at least has a relationship with. Before he leaves, though, he makes a promise to his father that the boat shall return. That if the boat returns with black sails, then that means that Theseus is dead. If the boat returns with white sails, that means that Theseus has lived and has succeeded in killing the Minotaur. So being Greek mythology, and what would you think happens at the end of this story when the boat returns? I don't want to spoil it, but I'll just say that this episode was okay. This is where the episode was... I was expecting the Jim Henson effects to really show up, and they did. Um, it does. The Minotaur itself doesn't really hold up quite as well as probably it did 20-something years ago, but it looked okay. And the story itself is was okay as well. It was another betrayal and curse kind of story. Um, I think after the high that is the Orpheus and Eurydice, that story... This one didn't really hold up as well. Um, but I can say that for a fact that my daughter enjoyed it. She watched this one. <laughs> my daughter watched this one with me. And whenever Theseus uh, killed the Minotaur, which is no surprise. I mean, most people know that. But what's funny is that as my daughter watched this story, she said, that's sad. It's making my eyes water and I don't know why. So she shed tears. For the Minotaur, and I thought that was kind of funny. So she she enjoyed it, but as a whole, and compared to the first two, this was not, in my opinion, as great or as good as the previous two. So so far, it was good, but just after, like I said, the Orpheus one, it just didn't really hold up as well, especially with the effects and just as a story that you kind of saw the end coming. And it's about pride, and it's the lesson of where pride leads you to. Anyway, guys, one more story. Next one is going to be about Perseus and Medusa. So let's check out that last story. And so the final story is Perseus and the Gorgon. Most of you guys know this story thanks to movies like Clash of the Titans, the classic, and the uh, newer one that came out in, I think, 2010. So we all know that Danae had the son Perseus, who was uh, prophesied to be a king and to kill his father. And so his stepfather, I should say, who was the king at the time. And so just like you've seen in the classic movies, the king locks Danae and Perseus into a box, throws them into the ocean, and eventually they are rescued and um, it leads eventually to the killing of the Gorgon or Medusa. So the story itself is definitely nothing like you've seen on the more recent movies because they actually stick closer to the actual Greek myth. So Danae um, is basically kidnapped by the king of the island she was rescued on and forced to marry him. And so Perseus goes to the island of the Gorgon so he can kill Medusa and take the head to get revenge for stealing his mother. So that is the story. The special effects are really well done. Now this is Jim Henson to the 100th degree. The Medusa, the Gorgon, the uh, sisters of the Gorgon, um, and all so many creature effects are done in this. And for that, it's really well done. But this story itself is probably on the same level as the previous of Theseus. Maybe it's because I've seen and I've heard these stories more than I have seen a film version. But um, to me, it was probably on the same level as the Theseus story. Another thing I want to say about it is that I think another issue with the story is that some of these, like the Theseus story and the Perseus story, they're trying to cram it all into 23 minutes. Each episode is about 23 minutes long. It can work for the Icarus and Deadliest story, 
it can work for the Orpheus in the Eurydice story. But when you get into Perseus and you get into the story of Theseus, it being crammed into 23 minutes, it's really cutting out some things. And that's what the storyteller is for. He can uh, explain some of the backstory that they weren't able to show due to time and obviously budget. Granted, though, that this series had a pretty good budget because the um, special effects and the makeup was really well done. But I think maybe that may be what be that's could be maybe 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 could be what's hurting the last two more than the previous two. That and to me the high standard was Orpheus and Eurydice. So if you see this, you can actually watch it up for free on Amazon Prime. It's for free for Prime members. But if you had to pick one or see one or buy one. Definitely Orpheus and the Eurydice story. And second would be um, the first, the Daedalus and Icarus. And if I had to rank it, I would probably say they're like it's hard to pick the um, next two because they're pretty equal. I guess for the special effects, the Perseus and Gorgon story that's what they called it, even though it's the Perseus fighting Medusa. That's called Perseus and the Gorgon. And then the least favorite is probably the Theseus and the Minotaur. Theseus and the Minotaur is probably my least favorite because, like I said, last, those last two are about equal, but at least Perseus and the Gorgon had more special effects. So for that, I enjoyed that a little more. Definitely Orpheus, though. But overall, really well done. Um, and that holds up. We watched it with our daughter, and she enjoyed Theseus and the Minotaur. She thought it made her sad. So it still reaches to kids. She wasn't bored. She wasn't asking to watch something else. And as far as myths go, this is probably the best representation of a myth I've ever seen on TV. This and the 1997 film, The Odyssey. That is probably my favorite all-time classic Greek myth movie because it really sticks close to the source material, and these stories do as well. And um, for that, I give it a lot of praise. If you want something that's really close to myth that is translated to film, definitely check out Jim Henson's Greek Mess, because there you go. It's almost a literal translation on film for those purists that want to see something that's actually closer to the actual story. Um, but yeah, go ahead and check it out. It's 110% worth seeing for free. I don't know how long it'll be for free on Amazon Prime, but it's definitely worth checking out while they have it. And I'll talk to you later, guys. And I'll see you in the new year. Bye.